family of young graphs, um, are, are what I call the cyclic graphs. And another family that I can analyze more or less are the complete graphs. The complete graphs have the property that every node is joined to every other node, including itself. And they have the most number of edges of any young graph. The cyclic ones have the smallest number of edges of, uh, of any, any uh, given number of nodes. So for example, so the cyclic graphs, I must admit they're still pretty mysterious, but the definition is the cyclic graph C3 has a cycle that I've drawn in red of length 3 and there's one edge which has an extra pair of edges in parallel going to the zero, zero node with a loop there. So the cyclic graph is a cycle plus a pair of edges. So uh, this is C2, C3, C4, and C5. This has one, two, three, four. If we ignore the starting node, it's got four nodes and one, two, three, four, five, six edges. These, these have this, uh, another experimental fact. These have the smallest number of edges for a given number of nodes. And um, the unfortunate thing is, I can't explain when they occur. So the first time you see this graph is when uh, the base is 49 and the multiplier is 16. The first time you see C3, this one is at 1711. The first time you see 4 is at 3411. And here's the list. So for the cyclic graphs, um, with a cycle of length m, m going from 1 to the 9, the first time these occur is at these values of the base. And these values are the multiplier. Now I collect sequences, and it is really annoying not to understand what this sequence is. It's totally mysterious. And you have no proof that it goes forever. I have no proof that it goes forever. I have a conjecture. She's on the next slide that it does. Um, if it does exist, if the cyclic graph does exist, then because the adjacency matrix is pretty simple, you can work out what the generating function is. And um, it's got a fairly simple numerator and a really simple denominator, um, which basically says that uh, to get the next term, you, it's the sum of the previous term and the term n minus 1 steps back. And I can almost prove, <laughs> well, I can almost describe what the reverse multiples are. If this exists, then we know there is a reverse multiple that goes, so, so look at C4. I say, because this cyclic graph exists, there is a reverse multiple. The smallest one goes from the starting node down to the first of the possibly two nodes at the bottom. So here, the smallest multiple would be 2, 21, and then we go back. No, I'm sorry, this, this is a, a, the first example you've seen of a pair of nodes, 10, 5, and 5, 10. This is an odd pivot node. So the reverse multiple you get is 2, 21, 16, and then you go back, 32, 28. I call that number gamma. That's the number, of the smallest reverse multiple, and you can read it off the graph. So that's gamma. We know it exists then I can almost prove that all the reverse multiples have the form gamma times beta, where um, the, the base G of expansion of beta is palindromic. Again, it has digits 0 and 1 only. And any run of zeros must have length at least n minus 1. And there can be no repeated ones. And the argument almost to prove this works. It's actually quite nice, I think. You can, first of all, you can look at the adjacency matrix and you can get the denominator easily, trivially, because you know, from the characteristic polynomial. 
of the adjacency matrix. Now, we know we have a reverse multiple gamma from the, reading it off the diagram, which we, which we are assuming to exist. So let me do an example. The cyclic one, C3, the first example is base 17 uh, multiplier 11. And if you read it off the diagram, you get gamma is 1, 5, 12, 14 to the base 17. Now, watch what happens when we multiply by 11. Um, so we're doing calculations mod 17. But because we can also read off the carry digits, we don't really have to work very hard. So we say 11 14s is 154, which is 9 times 17 plus 1. So the carry is 9. Um, 11 times 12 is plus 9 is 141, which is 8 times 17 plus 5, and so on. And we get 1 14 12. We get 14, 12, 5, 1, which is the reverse of what we started with. So we verify directly that this is a reverse multiple. Now, the claim is that if beta, beta doesn't have any runs of repeated ones or any runs of zeros of length less than m minus 1, in other words, less than 2, so runs of length 2 zeros are OK. So this is a typical beta. I claim that gamma times beta is a reverse multiple. You prove that by just doing the long multiplication table. So, so there's beta, and gamma, I'm assuming is something, let me write it as A, B, C, D. In this case, it's a four-digit number, which is on the previous uh, slide. Now, when you do the long multiplication, you get A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D, and A, B, C, D. You add them up, and you get A, B, C, A plus D, B, C, A plus D, B, C, D. Now, we know that gamma is itself a reverse multiple. So when we multiply by k, it just reverses. If now we take k times beta times gamma, we do the same calculation, and we get the same number in the reverse order. Provided a plus d didn't overflow, we're home free. We know that the reverse is equal to the reverse, as it should be. Unfortunately, that's the conjecture. Mm -hmm. I thought I could prove it, but not managed to do it. The conjecture says, because we're not in that, the case of the 1089 graph, the sum of the first and the last digits is strictly less than the base. So there's no overflow, there's no carry when we do this addition. So we get the same tableau in reverse. If there had been carries, this would have propagated here, and it would have messed up. It would no longer be the reverse. And um, so now we can, so, we, so now we have a large collection of reverse multiples by this argument, assuming the conjecture is true. Now we can enumerate them, and it's not difficult to show that we get the same generating function. Um, I'll skip that. By direct counting, we can show that the number of these betas is equal to um, the numbers that come out of the generating function that we got from the adjacency matrix. So that proves, modulo that conjecture, that we've established what all of the reverse multiples are in this case for the cyclic graphs. At the other extreme, the graphs with the maximal number of edges are the complete graphs. So here's K3. Apart from the starting node, it's got three other nodes, and you have edges between every possible pair of nodes. And, um, so K2 is the, 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 the base 5 multiplied 2 example I already showed you. K3 doesn't appear until um, base 11 multiplier 3, and you get that, you get K4, and you can prove that if, if the base g is of the form n squared plus m minus 1 and the multiplier is m, then you get km. And the nodes, the node labels, are all pairs rr. They have to be identical because they're all going to be even pivot nodes. You can work out what the generating function is because the adjacency matrix 
is just a block, a solid block of x squared. And um, you can work out what the reverse multiples are. So this is a case where it's actually not so difficult to analyze everything. And the reverse multiples, the smallest one is like that example I gave of 1, 3 base 5. It generalizes to be A base G, where A and B, A and B are given by this relationship. So, There's a conjecture that um, we get the complete graph on M nodes if and only if there are M solutions. We need we need um, we need a pair of numbers B and A that have to lie in this range if there are M such numbers, then we get the complete graph on M nodes. So that's another conjecture. These conjectures seem really obstinate. Um, you can prove, I can prove parts of them, but not the whole thing. Um, one thing I can prove is that you get the complete graph on, on M nodes if and only if all the node labels have the form R. But what seems to be true is a much stronger fact that if any one of the nodes has a label to form R, R, then you get the complete graph. These, this, again, um, um, I didn't say what beta is. But beta is palin again, beta is palindromic, and it contains digits 0 through m minus 1. So this is, again, a palindromic case. The palindromic case is when the reverse multiples are, um, have the property that they're all of the form some constant gamma, gamma standing for GCD. It's the GCD of all the solutions times a palindromic number, beta, which is usually satisfies some simple constraints. Now, here's another example. This is the 2413 Young graph. Things have gotten a lot more complicated. The generating function is, however, very simple. Uh, the smallest reverse multiple is this, um, at length 9, corresponding to the x to the ninth. And uh, again, this is palindromic. The, the reverse multiples are, there's a GCD, which is not the same as the smallest reverse multiple. But they, the, all the multiples are gamma times beta. Ba beta is, again, binary, palindromic. It, every run of zeros and ones must have length at least three. And you can easily count how many there are check that it agrees with and as an example the smallest reverse multiple is gamma times 111 so 111 satisfies the rules it's got a run of length 3 of 1's so it's illegal it's palindromic so we get a solution on the other hand the 4013 Young graph looks like that its generating function is that and this is not palindromic there's no possible choice of gamma such that you can say well, that all the reverse multiples are of the form gamma times a palindrome. And my last slide is some general remarks about properties of Young graphs. Um, the, the label on an edge is determined by the labels on the nodes. There are no parallel edges. Between any two nodes, there's at most one edge. A really nice property is that if you have an edge going from a node RS to a node TU, then there's also an edge that goes from the reverse of the node, the nodes, with a label which is the reverse of the edges. This is a very useful property. And from that you can prove that all the node labels are distinct, the edge labels are distinct. And 
one last thing. I haven't been able to settle the question of whether the graph itself determines the pivot nodes. This gives you an involution because you, this gives a mapping. If, let me uh, go back one slide. This, I've drawn this in such a way that you see the involution. This is the young graph. If you switch the node labels, so um, 5, 3 to 3, 5, anything with identical node labels is on the axis, and there's a symmetry that swaps the two sides. What I don't know is whether it's possible to have two different young graphs that have different pivot nodes but have the same directed graph, the same underlying directed graph. I don't know. All right, I'll stop there. We have one minute for questions. Are those graphs, say, like planar? No, not in general. Uh, very often they are, but I don't know exactly when. In fact, I, there are many open questions. What graphs occur? How many, what, for, for a given <coughs> base, G, how many different k's are there? I mean, I could give a large number of uh, unsolved questions. You can tabulate all the graphs up to a certain... Up to a, uh, G, up to 100, with one exception, where the graph was too big. Uh -huh. Well, I can compute the graphs. Yeah. The trouble is, very often there are extra edges that don't lead anywhere. Dead ends. Yeah. So you have to throw them away before you can figure out what the graph really is. And some of these have huge paths that may or may not terminate. So I have a computer print, I mean, I have a file with all the graphs if anyone is interested. Do you have any uh, new from world uh, operation, like you take the two matrices that work and then form the chronicle product or something, and you get new sequences from world? It's a good question. I, I haven't found anything like that. Yeah. yeah. It's, the whole thing is extremely mysterious, actually. No, no, no. Okay, Evelyn, 6.45. Nice